Thanks, and thanks everyone for joining us. I'm really excited to tell you more about the CSPM Archives Collection and get you excited about uh, conducting research in our reading room and also um, using the digital tools that are on our website. I thought I would just give you a little background about myself um, before we talk about what an archivist does. Um, so as Meg said, I am the archivist at the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. I started in this position in November, um, and I'll tell you a bit about what brought me here. Um, I was a history major because I wanted to work in museums, and this led to a museum studies graduate degree. And after a brief stint of um, moving giant squids and vacuuming rocks at the National Museum of Natural History, I landed um, the job that I, I envisioned myself getting with a degree in history and museum studies. And that was um, work as the photo archivist and the research assistant to the historian at the White House Historical Association. Um, it was in this position that I really got my feet wet in archival research. Um, I spent many hours at the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and in special collections throughout the city. And it was really overwhelming to me um, and intimidating at first. I, I can understand how it would be um, daunt, how it is daunting to form a research question and know where to start um, with archival collections. And I learned, I have learned through my work three really important messages that I wanted to share with you. One is that all you need to be a good researcher is curiosity, and anyone can do it, and everyone should try it. The second is you won't learn until you get started. And the last and perhaps equally important is that archivists are actually very helpful and, and quite friendly. So you should always feel comfortable reaching out to archivists in archival collections or special collections. Um, they can help you get started and make you comfortable in working in um, the collections. Okay, so I moved to Colorado Springs in 2011, and I actually worked as the registrar here at the museum um, from 2012 to 2017. And that gave me a great introduction to Pike Peak region history, and I learned a lot about the CSPM collection. Um, so that's my background. Um, working in the archives, my main mission is to preserve our collection, but to also encourage everyone to use it and make it accessible. Um, so in today's program, the main message that I want to get across to you is that the CSPM archives is yours. It's your archives to use, and I want to encourage you to use this valuable resource. Okay, so um, let's get started. <laughs> I thought I would first tell you um, a little bit about the collection, give you an overview of what we have in our collection. Then we're going to talk about some myths that um, may keep you from doing research in the, at the museum or in any archival collection for that matter. And then we're going to go over some great research tools that you can use online or in the reading room to get you started with your research. So a little bit about the archives. The Colorado Springs Museum, our mission is to build a lasting connection to the Pikes Peak region by preserving and sharing our cultural history. We have been a collecting institution since 1896. And since then, because of generous donors, our archival collection has grown to over 6,000 cubic feet of manuscript materials, um, oral histories, film reels, photographs. It includes maps, blueprints, 
a reference library, um, city directories, and more. Um, preservation of the collection of our artifacts and archival materials is our top priority. So only a portion of the collection is ever on exhibit. That is where the importance of encouraging research comes in and providing access to the collections through research requests. Okay, here is the door to our reading room. The CSPM uh, Special Collection and Archives are, in, are at the Sarsmore Center for Local History. And that is at the lower level of the museum or our English basement. Um, it is open from one to four, Tuesday through Saturday, uh, by appointment. So Hillary, uh, just a quick question. It, how is it different from like a library if you wanted to go and visit a library and look at books? Okay, so that's a great question. Thanks, Meg. The main different is, difference is we have, um, it's a non-circulating library. So the books you see before me, you are welcome to come in and use these resources, but we don't check materials out. Um, another difference is, is in the archival collection, we have unpublished materials. So what is in our collection is unique to our repository, to our archive. Um, and that's what makes the research experience really special in archives versus just going to a library and picking up a book. Um, and can you just show up at the archive like you could a library just any time? No, well, we have open hours, one to four, um, but we ask for research appointment requests so that we can prepare the materials for, for research. So that is another big difference. Thank you again. Um, yeah, so those are the differences. One, we do not circulate our materials. We use them within the reading room. And two, you make a research appointment so that we can prepare those materials for your use. Um, I should also mention we also take precautions in the, in the reading room to protect and preserve our materials. So when you come down to the reading room, you will sign um, a set of guidelines after reviewing them of how to safely handle the materials, um, You'll put your bag in a locker in the reading room. We only allow the use of pencils, and we also will give you a pair of gloves to use to handle the materials. And that's all in balancing the access and preservation um, points of our mission. Okay? All right. Um, so I just wanted to get across that please contact me anytime with any research questions or questions about using the CSPM collection because that is why we are here. That's why I'm here and I would be happy to hear from you. Um, you could reach me by phone, um, email, or we also have an online research appointment form and Meg can share that with you. Um, you could also easily find it on the collection page that we'll be reviewing um, shortly. Okay, so I want to go over some basic definitions of what we have in the CSPM archives collection. The, we primarily have uh, manuscript collections at the CSPM archives. And what is a manuscript? Um, a manuscript, manuscripts are unpublished materials. So as I was just talking about before, it, it makes them really unique and special to our repository because you will not find them anywhere else. Um, they're unpublished materials by an individual, organizations, or businesses. So an example would be a letter. It could be a draft that an author prepared for a book before it was published. It could include a journal or 
Um, well, I think <laughs> notes, research observations, anything like that, maybe sketches. Um, the, that covers a manuscript collection. So this is an example. This is a, an entry from a journal from Lando Bartlett. And we have Lando Bartlett's diaries that range from 1943 to 1974. He was a Colorado Springs resident. He was an accountant for the Holly Sugar Company. But he was also a member of a poetry society and of the American Legion. So he's an interesting guy. Um, we actually have a volunteer transcribing his diaries. And this ent particular entry is about the atomic bomb created during World War II. Um, so he noted it in his August 6, 1945 entry. Just an example of something special that you might find in a manuscript collection. Um, showing how a Pikes Peak resident experienced this unique time. And Hillary, the Palmer Journal Challenge, is that an example of a manuscript? Yes, the Palmer Collection is also a manuscript collection. So we have been sharing uh, the Queen and um, General Palmer's honeymoon journal. They created a travel journal together on their honeymoon in England in 1871. And we are encouraging everyone to join in. We post a page every week and you can transcribe um, and learn about, more about their travels um, through the process. So thanks to anyone who has joined in and please check it out on our website. Okay, um, the next type of material that we have that's really fun to work in and can also be really useful in um, exploring the history of the Pikes Peak region is our ephemera collection. The easiest way for me to uh, explain what ephemera is is just by giving you some examples. So that would include um, tickets, to a concert, for example, or a graduation program, a greeting card, a menu, um, a train time timetable, time anything like that. Um, they're just simple things that we, we collect now, um, but could tell future researchers about what life was like in 2020, for example. Um, so in this slide, you'll see, um, a ticket to go ice skating on Prospect Lake in 1902. So we learned that there was ice skating <laughs> in Prospect Lake in 1902. Um, interestingly, from this ticket, I was um, accessing newspaper articles in Pikes Peak News Finder to learn more about this. And that same year, someone opened an ice house on Prospect Lake to harvest the ice and use it um, during the summer months. So that's just an example of how one single archival item can spur or inspire you to want to learn more. Okay, this is a really great photograph, I must say. Um, our photograph collection is the most approachable and it is the most used collection um, here in our archive. And please allow me to use the cliche, a picture tells a thousand words. Then I'm going to take it a step further and say, imagine what a collection of thousands of photographs could tell you. We have a general, photo, a general photograph collection, um, and that is organized by subject. So um, it's you, it is organized by business, for example, or schools, or Pikes Peak Auto Highway. Um, we have files based on individuals within the Pikes Peak region community. Um, that's our general collection. But then we also have photographs that are nested within our manuscript collection. Um, this is a great example. Uh, Sarah Cartwright Jackson Loomis was a resident of Colorado Springs 
and her husband was a doctor in the community and she also had two children. Um, she took hundreds of photographs that document the history of the Pikes Peak region and of Colorado Springs. Um, she also photographed her children and their family's travels. And we're lucky enough to have her photo albums in our collection, along with uh, letters between her and her family and her diaries. This collection is of the 1912 balloon race, and the setting is Washburn Field at Colorado College. Okay. Last, the Maps and Blueprints collection is another um, collection that is one of my favorite resources. Uh, it includes several hundred rare and historical maps of the region. Um, this, the map collection was actually used in the development of our Story of Us um, digital storytelling tool, which we will visit later. Um, and the maps used for that platform ranged from 1882 all the way to 1984. We also have a great blueprint um, and drawings collection that includes blueprints and drawings of historic buildings throughout Colorado Springs, including our very own El uh, Paso County Courthouse. And it also includes buildings that aren't standing anymore, such as the Burns Theater, or buildings that still remain today. Um, right here, we're, we're um, we're looking at the drawing of the facade of the Colorado Springs Day Nursery, which is still used as um, a child care and learning center, and it's on South Tejon Street and Rio Grande. So here's the original plan for that building, um, and you can actually walk by it and see it today. So, that's a general overview of what we have in our collection. They're just highlights. Um, we also have um, city directories in the, in the reading room here. They range from 1880, oh, excuse me. Um, I'm lost on my date here. Very early on, I'll say, so as early as the 18, mid 1870s, all the way to 2006. And that's a great resource to use. Um, say you're researching your um, home, for example. You could access those directories to learn more about who lived there and get started with your research in that way. Or you might get started um, learning about a, an individual in the directories. You could look up their name and learn about where they lived, um, what their profession was, et cetera. And of course, as I mentioned, um, behind me, we also have a non-circulating reference library. This includes books um, related to Pike Peak regional history, but also state history and, and some um, national history as well. And we also have a rare books collection that is surrounding us in the reading room right now. Okay, <laughs> that is an overview of the collection. I thought this would be a great point just to pause and see if anyone had any questions um, either about research or about the collection itself. We have one coming um, so far, and okay. uh, they want to know, can you schedule an appointment if you just want to learn more and explore, or do you have to have a research question in a project that's guiding your visit to the archive? Okay, that's a great question. Um, yes, you are welcome to schedule an appointment just for a general exploratory research experience. Um, and that would include just accessing our reference library. Um, we request research appointments um, 
so that we can actually pull the materials and prepare for your visit. Um, is, that, is that clear? Yes? Okay, so yes, you are welcome to come in, but um, if you do not have a research topic in mind and you still want to come in and use the archives, don't let that discourage you. Please give me a call or send me an email and maybe through our discussion, you can determine what exactly you would like to explore. And that way we can, um, I could actually pull some materials for you to work with while you're in the reading room. Awesome. And then um, a question, how often can you come in like during the week if you're doing research? Okay, you can come in as often as you want during the week. Um, the main thing is we are limited in space and in, um, and in archivists. I'm a department of one. So we just ask, we limit the reading room to four researchers at a time. Um, so depending on the schedule and who else is coming in, you are welcome to come in multiple times. We've had researchers from out of town, for example, who have spent all week in the reading room and it's great to have them here. There was a question about, you'd mentioned rare books. What is, um, do you think the most interesting rare book in the collection? <laughs> um, well, I think one of the most interesting um, rare book collections within our collection um, is the library of Helen Hunt Jackson. And a portion of those books are actually on exhibit in the house. You'll see them in the, what is it called, Meg? The little nook. It's her flirtation corner. Flirtation corner, yes. Yeah. Um, and then, but we also have some down here in the collection or in the reading room. Excuse me. Yeah. These are another great. fun book. I, I just have to say, is we just cataloged into the collection and is an example is a uh, first aid manual for Girl Scouts in the 1940s. So, that's kind of a fun thing to see and um, something that any researcher can use. Awesome. Well, yeah, please keep the questions coming. I know Hillary's more than happy to answer throughout. Okay, ready to roll? Okay, here we go. So next I really wanted to, um, engage in, in busting some myths that could hinder your research endeavors. And the first one is that his, the history of the Pikes Peak region is based on the big players. So uh, businessmen, railroad tycoons, politicians, or hey, pioneers. Um, but I just want to say that early um, collecting efforts and scholarly publications up until the 20th century, yes, they may have supported this belief. Um, However, our interpretation and use of historical resources has really changed since then, and the CSPM collection certainly reflects this. We want to tell the whole story, and the big picture is made of thousands and thousands of individual experiences and stories. So to help, um, help uh, illustrate this point. I'm just going to give you a, a couple of examples of stories that have been collected and that are available for research in the archives. The first is one of my favorite stories. Um, it is the story of Floris, Florence Standish. She is a registered nurse. She's also the first superintendent of Bethel Hospital. And she established and ran Knob Hill Lodge Sanitarium um, for the treatment of tuberculars. Um, and that stood around where Memorial Central stands now. Um, because of her expertise in the treatment of um, tuberculosis patients, she was actually called to serve during World War I. Um, she was the lead nurse at a, the first army hospital um, built especially for the treatment of soldiers who had tuberculosis. 
um, that was in Asheville, North Carolina. And one of my favorite points, um, or one of the, the greatest parts of Florence was she was also a single mom of two adopted children. And her children were along, they were at her side throughout her career. One letter we have from her collection actually shows that she refused to come to Asheville to work at the Army Hospital unless she was able to bring her son Robert with her. Um, so it just shows her dedication as a mother, but also as a, her career as a nurse. Um, this collection came in from her family. So in 2017, members of, of Standish's family donated this photograph you see of her in her U.S. Army uniform. Um, they also uh, donated her nurse's ledger from the U.S. Army Hospital, which included some letters and some um, a pamphlet of the Knob Hill Lodge, and that's where this image you see here is from. So it was just a a great full circle story that her family came and donated the materials to the archives so that researchers could learn more about um, Florence. The next collection um, shows that we collect stories and materials during the exhibit development process or sometimes individuals may come to an exhibit and visit the museum and realize that their story should be told or that their story relates to something that we talk about in our exhibit. An exa a recent example of this is the Conejos Neighborhood Project. Um, we opened Una Familia, Familia Grande, um, the Conejos Neighborhood Project exhibit um, in February. Um, and this was the result of over two years' work. Um, our curator and former archivist, Leah Davis Witherow, worked with members of the Conejos neighborhood community in a community-based storytelling project to put this vibrant neighborhood back on the map. Um, the Conejos neighborhood stood where America the Beautiful Park is now. Um, and as a result of this project, many members of the community donated photographs, artifacts, materials, and their stories through oral history to the museum. A portion of these materials are now on exhibit, but they will all be available to researchers in the future. So that's where access through research is really important. Um, and these types of donations just make a lasting impact because they're helping us tell the full story, the full history of the Pikes region. Hillary, there's a question that relates to that. Um, Susan wants to know, are you always adding to your collection? Are you interested in obtaining documented historic information about individuals and homes? And then what's that criteria for adding to our collection? Yes, yes, yes. We are always adding to our collection. Thank you for asking that question. It is always growing because the stories never stop. Um, I just want to share one collecting initiative that we're doing right now. It's related to collecting stories and materials um, related to the COVID-19 pandemic experience. So we are calling for um, stories, objects, materials, um, such as photographs, journal entries. Um, one group of students um, is contributing their journals um, to the archives. We are always open to receiving um, donations. Um, the criteria is that it helps tell the story of the Pikes Peak region. Um, that is our main criteria, that it supports the mission of the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. And we just have to be responsible in our collecting efforts as well, um, knowing that we will be preserving these materials for hundreds of years. Um, so we always look at the condition of the materials. Um, so that's another criteria that we consider. 
Um, is that is that clear? Or can I go into that any further? I think that's perfect. Yeah. Okay. I'll just say one more thing that once we receive a donation, we always present it to our acquisitions committee, which meets quarterly. So um, we present new donations to them, and and it is voted on whether the materials should be added to the collection. So it, it isn't my decision or our registrars or curators. It's a community effort. Okay. Okay, this next myth I have heard um, from some visitors to the museum. I think that the fact that we uh, require uh, research appointments sends the wrong message sometimes. So I have heard someone say that we, the CSPM archives is open to researchers by appointment only and we never let anyone in. And that is just not true. We are here for researchers and that is why we're here. Um, it's great to have our tables full of curious minds. Um, so I just wanted to explain, and I think we talked about this earlier, um, but the reason we require and ask for research appointments is so that researchers can have the most fruitful um, research day possible. So it's easy to make an appointment um, if you just contact me and we'll talk about what you're researching, what you're curious about, and that way I can have materials available for you when you come into the room. And again, there are our hours. We're Tuesday through Saturday, one to four. Okay, and the last myth that can have a paralyzing effect or create research block um, is that many people believe that only scholars, professors, or historians can research in primary documents. And I am here to say that yes, you can. Finding primary sources is like going on an adventure. You just have to keep an open mind um, and just use the resources in front of you and ask for guidance and help. Everyone can research and everyone should be encouraged to do so. So I thought I would just give you a couple examples of research, um, research appointments that I recently had. So one was a, a high school student who was working on her History Day project on the Fannie Mae Duncan's Cotton Club. She came in with her, um, her teacher to access the Fannie Mae Duncan collection. Another example is a gentleman contacted us. His great grandfather was a member of the local Carpenters Union 515. And he wanted to find when his um, ancestor was inducted into the union. We have a collection of the ledgers of the Carpenters Union Minutes, and it was so exciting because while he came to the reading room, um, he browsed through several of the ledgers, and then he finally found his family name within the 1901 Minutes book. So that was just an exciting, happy ending. Um, those are the kinds of things. I just want to say that I learn something every time that a researcher comes into the reading room. Um, through your research, I learn as well. And so, thanks. <laughs> um, so, I, another uh, research appointment we just had was a Gazette reporter came in and she researched mothers in the Pikes Peak region. Um, so, she accessed the Florence Standish collection, uh, Sarah Cartwright Jackson Loomis, and the Stroud family collection to, um, to write a story about moms in the Pikes Peak region. Okay. Um, so, any questions now, or should we just get started on learning about how to? 
get started with research. I see. Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. All right. So the first thing that you want to do is form your research question. And I'm going to share a couple tools online um, on our website that you can use if you just you want to come in and use the archives, but you don't really know what you want to research yet. So I'm just going to pull up our story of us tool. Okay, so the story of us is our online storytelling platform. And you can find it under exhibits, or you could also find it in the collection page. And it's a great place to start to just get a, some ideas about um, Pikes Peak Regional History and the kinds of primary sources that we have in our collection. Uh, Leah Davis Witherow um, recently created a how-to video that you could use to learn more about how to use this great resource. And, um, Meg shared the link with you earlier today, but we're also sending a follow-up um, a follow-up email that will include the link to this video and to the story of us. I'm just going to pop in briefly to give you um, a quick preview and an example of how it might inspire your resource. So here we have it, and it's of course the story of us called the Pikes Peak region from A to Z, and we are adding new themes to this to this experience all the time. Um, but if you go scan over the letters, you'll see different topics that might inspire you to do more research. So I'm just going to click on Professor Kerr to give you a. a quick idea of how this works. Okay, so it will give you a narrative. And then if we click on any of the balloons, you'll also see some of the great primary sources from our collection that can help answer your research um, questions or be a starting off point to come to the reading room and work in the collections yourself. Okay. The next tool that I want to share with you is our online database. Um, oh, here it is. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> okay, so if we go, if we go. Here, here's the database. This can be found on our collections page. Meg shared a link with you again through the chat function, and I'll also will also send you the link in the follow-up email. The database is a, another great tool to inspire your research or to support your research once you know what your question is. Um, we feature collections. Um, that's one way to access or to use the database. So let's see, I'm going to click on Charles Craig, for example. And this is like, we searched for these collections and now we are featuring them on the database page. So here are paintings by Charles Craig in the CSPM collection. Another way to spark your curiosity is by browsing the collection. If you click browse, it just pulls up a bunch of random records from the database. It's kind of fun. So every time you click browse, something new pops up, something random. So you could click browse, click an image, and then decide to jump from your, jump there to conduct your research. Jump from there to conduct your research. I'm just going to walk you through some of the uh, search functions. So the most basic function is a keyword search. And I was playing with this earlier. So I'm going to search in the most broad, you could see my research, um, my past research too. So I'm just going to search for courthouse and we are going to get a lot of entries. Um, this is going to be from the object collection and from the archival collection. So it shows you here 
there's 485 records related to courthouse. And that's just not our courthouse. It might also include the Teller County Courthouse, for example. Um, if we go to advanced search with that same search term, I can select what catalogs I actually want to search in. So say I only want to know about items in the archive collection. I would unclick objects, unclick all of the catalog except for archives, library, and photos. And then I'm going to go to description and I will enter courthouse again and let's see what we find. Okay, so here are some records from the archives collection. Let's see, how many did we pull up? 178 records. And I just want to say that although this um, database has a vast majority of our collection, it doesn't have all of our collection. So it's always important to reach out to the archivist, myself, to, if you don't see what you're looking for, please contact me to learn more. Okay, so I'm going to show you keyword search and advanced search, but you could also go into specific collections. So you could just search for courthouse and archives. And there you have it. So these are only up our items that are in the archival collection related to the courthouse. It's fun just to play around in the database and um, you can learn about what we have in our collection or um, just browse some of the photographs. Just have fun with it and, and again, be open with your research and how you use the database. Okay, so those are some of our digital tools, the database and then of course the story of us. I'm just going to um, point you in the direction of the Sarsmore for Center Local History page on our website. And that includes some more traditional research tools. Um, so I'm going to click on collection. And then I'm going to go to Sarsmore Center for Local History. Okay, this just brought me to the collections page. So the next thing I'm going to do is select archives. Here we go. So this is a great page for you to use. It has um, describes our collection. Here's our research appointment hours. Uh, there's my contact information. You can get that uh, research, request an appointment form that Meg shared a link with you for. Um, get directions, learn about parking, et cetera, et cetera. Then you get down, scroll down a bit more, and there are some research tools. So this is your researcher's toolbox, and we have our online catalog here. Here's the Story of Us um, platform that we just reviewed. And then we're going to jump into a listing of our manuscript collection. And you can use this um, listing in a couple ways. It can be to inspire your research, or you might have a, a research question already in mind. So you want to, you could browse this listing to see if we have anything in the collection to support your research. It's an alphabetical list, um, and I'm just going to scroll down a little bit to give you an idea of what it's all about. Um, it will give you the collection name, and then just kind of describe the size of the collection and what the contents of the collection as well. I just want to note again that this list is always being added to, so it is expensive, but it's not all inclusive. So again, if you do not see what you're looking for, please reach out to me so that we can, um, you can learn about what we have to support your research. I'm going to go back. Oh, actually I'm not. Let me show you this great tool. When you're in any research tool function, 
there's a sidebar here. So you don't have to go back to the collection page. You could just keep working from here. The last thing I want to show you is the um, finding aids and inventories. And I can, I can see we're running a bit long here. So um, this is the last research tool that I'm going to show you. And then we could take some questions and, and do some exercises if you have time to do that. Um, finding aid, what is a finding aid? Um, a finding aid is basically a map showing you how to use a collection, especially large archival collections. Um, it describes the contents of the collection in an inventory, so it lists what is in the collection. And then it tells you where to find it. So I'll just open one of our finding aids. Let's do the Tim Nicholson collection, for example. All right, so. So it will explain where the collection is, what it is, the provenance, where it had been, how it was donated to the museum. And then it gives you some uh, background information. So it's going to give us biographical information of the Palmer family members who are represented in this collection. Um, so of course we start with William Jackson Palmer. And I'm just going to scroll down. This is all the biographical information. Um, the individual who created the finding aid will also include sources where they got the information from. So that's another great jumping off point. You could use it to learn about um, secondary sources you could learn, use for your resource. And then as we go down, there are, there's the timeline. No, I'm moving quite quickly. Sorry if I'm making anyone dizzy. Okay, here's the listing of what is the collection. So we have books, photographs, ephemera, correspondence, and then it gets down to the nitty gritty. So we have what series it's in and where we can find it. Um, you are not allowed alone in your use of the finding aid. You could always work with the archivist to locate the materials that you are looking for. Um, and an inventory is the same thing as a finding aid, but it doesn't include the biographical sketches or the um, provenance information. It's just simply a listing of the contents of the collection, and it tells you where you can find it, find materials you're looking for within that collection. So for example, box two, folder five. Um, it saves you from having to browse through the entire collection. You can just get right to what you're looking for. Okay, I think that ends my introduction to research tools. Thanks everyone. Um, does anyone have any questions? And then would you like to do a couple of examples, um, a couple of challenges to use the resources that we just reviewed together? I do see a couple questions. I'll have to go back here. Oh, um, there was a question about, do you work with the um, Pikes Peak Library Archive ever? Absolutely, they're one of our greatest partners. Um, and there are a couple tools that I want to point you to um, from the Pikes Peak Library District. One is the Pikes Peak News Finder that I use and all the time, and it's a great jumping off point for your research. Um, it can be found on their website, or you could just, of course, um, Google it, Pikes Peak News Finder. And it just gives you, it's an index of his, uh, historic Gazette articles. So it can give you background information on um, multiple subjects. So that's how I learned about the 1912 balloon race, for example. Um, they have a great uh, photograph collection and special collections as well. Um, so yes, in short, we always work with them. And um, if we don't have what you're looking for in your research, Pikes Peak Library District may, or there are other repositories in Colorado Springs, such as the special collections at Colorado College, that might be a better uh, source for you in your research. And um, 
again, that's why we're here. So I could help you locate those, the best repository for your research. Awesome. And then somebody asked what our earliest materials are. Mm. Um, well, we do have um, the Gammon family collection, which is a family who settled in Ramos, Colorado. Um, that's one of our earliest pioneer family collections. Um, another really exciting um, single item is the petition um, signed by members of the community to incorporate Colorado Springs as a city. And that was from 18, oh my gosh, 1872. <laughs> um, and I, I have to say I am new to the archive, so I'm learning every day as well. But those are a couple of the items that I can tell you off the top of my head um, as the earliest items from the collection. You can also use our database to learn that as well. You could search by date um, or just explore the collection on your own. There was a, a great question about as you're working through these collections, um, you may find discrepancies or things that are a little off. What's your process for correcting um, any of these issues you find? Hmm. Well, date or um, someone's misnamed or I'm sorry can you say that again Meg maybe yeah like if a, if the date was possibly wrong or if there's a, a name a new name you learn how do you update those records or change them if needed sure well we are always open um in fact some of our researchers contact us they may see information that we have incorrect in our database which is always possible. There are humans behind data entry. And so, and we are learning more and more about our collection all the time. So, um, when we realize that there's a mistake in, say, well, I don't know, a transcription or a database record, um, we would just update that record so that it gives a more accurate picture of. Um, the collection or the collection item. Thank you, Hillary. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Anything else? No, I think it's okay to see to walk through one of these processes. Okay, so let's do it. So, Meg, will you please um reshare the database and I'm going to give you um two database challenges and I'm also going to work on that challenge myself but not until after I give you a few minutes to try the database. Um, so your first database challenge is I want to learn more about City Hall. So, no, just kidding. So, <laughs> go ahead and use some of the search tools that I taught you from the database. You can use the keyword search, advanced search, um, or you could search within specific uh, collection catalogs. Uh, I'll just give you a, a couple minutes and I'd love to hear something that you found from the database that could tell you more about City Hall. Hillary, can I ask a question? Yes. I'm curious, I saw in your search um, history, you had some um, of your searches in italics and quotations. What's the difference between doing that and not doing that? So that's a really important tip. Um, and you'll see that under search hints as well. So if you just search for city hall without quotes, it would pull up every single record that had the word city in it and every single record that had the word hall in it as well. So if you just want to know about City Hall, or if you were searching a name, for example, you would want to put that in quotes so that you limit your search to what you're actually searching for. That's a great question, Meg. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to um, start doing my own search. So, if you just want to follow along here, um, I'm going to use advanced search actually, and I want to see everything in the collection.
Okay. Um, let's see. You can then also limit your search to date. So say you know something, you're curious about something specific that happened in a specific year in City Hall. You could limit that by date if you would like to. Um, I'm not going to do that. I like to search broad when I'm first starting my research and then kind of whittle down from there. Before I press search, I'd like to hear from you. Has anyone found something they would like to share in the database about City Hall? I found a great photo of the CSPD taking a photo on the front steps uh -huh. of City Hall. So that's kind of cool. Nice. Okay. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead and, and search. I, I hope you're all trying this out on your own or that you will after the presentation. Um, so here we go. Here's what I found on City Hall. And you can see it involves object objects, but it also goes into the archival collection. So let's see, Meg, did you search in advance search as well? I didn't. I did the keyword, but I did okay. the italics. And there's, yeah, there's the, the photo I found, a couple down. Okay, well, I'm just going to pull another one. So I pulled the photo record. This is of a 1913 snow um, storm in Colorado Springs. And here's the record. It tells you all about the photograph, the catalog number, the collection. So this is the general photographs collection I was telling you. So this is filed under natural disasters snow. And then if you want to take a larger look at the photograph, you can actually click, click on it just once and you'll see a, a better view of that um, thumbnail. Okay, let's, let's try one more <laughs> subject just to get everyone um, comfortable. The next thing I want to learn about is Fannie Mae Duncan. And <clears throat> For my search here, I'm just going to go into the photos collection, but go ahead and try any kind of, um, any catalog or search um, function that you would like. And you know, I'm going to just search for Duncan, just to give you an idea of if you search extremely broad, what you might come up with. So I'm searching for Duncan. Okay, and you could see that I pulled up everything that has the name Duncan in it, or we might even come up with, um, well, it has the, the description has Duncan in it, so it may not be our Fannie Mae Duncan. But there's something to be said about these broad searches because they may point you into a different research project. So here's a photograph. Um, from the Fannie Mae Duncan of Fannie Mae Duncan. Okay. So there you go. Well, I've never seen that one. That's great. See, <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the um, again searching broad at first can it can be fun and it can help you learn new things about collections. Anyone else? I don't think so. I think they were following along with you. That's great. Okay. Well, I'm just going to, we're going to do a couple of using the manuscript collection list just to show that you can also approach your research this way. It doesn't have to be through the database. We can go, let me get, I might, yeah, I have to get back to the collections page. So my research question was, do you have anything about the Adamant collection? So hmm, I'm going to go to the manuscripts collection page. And then I can just browse down. And that was kind of an easy one. It's A, so it's right in the beginning of the list. But we can see that we actually have a rather large collection dedicated to the history of the Adamant Club. Um, and some of these collections have links that go to um, guided collection database searches. Okay, I think that is um, the end here. Does anyone have any questions before we wrap it up? 
Looks like um, someone search on Helen. It's a broad one too, and we found a picture of a fire arm. Cool. Okay. But yeah, yeah, okay. it's it's fun once you get started. You can just search and browse and just learn through the database. So thank you very much. And just the the last mention, Hillary. Um, are we going to be doing research appointments anytime soon? Do do we have any um, information on that that you know of? Um, we do not have any immediate plans um, or definite plans to open the reading room, but we do hope to open it soon. Um, unfortunately, I can't give you a, a specific date or time. However, I'll be sure to let you know um, through our, our website um, when the reading room is open. Um, and also, please feel free, if you do have a research question before the reading room opens, please contact me because I could um, point you to um, online resources or help you to answer your research question um, with the access that I have to the collection right now. Um, so I guess I'll say I hope we can welcome you all into the reading room soon. But don't let that discourage you from starting up your research or contacting me with questions. Thank you so much. That was great. I learned a ton. I know as an educator, um, research is something that's kind of intimidating to me. So I appreciated that as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for tuning in on this beautiful day. And um, I really hope to hear from you.